hello, welcome back. Where did we leave off? Oh yes, classroom 13, unlucky classroom 13. So Miss Linda had won a lottery ticket. She promised to split it with her class. So she did. Each class member got $1,037,037,004. And we're going to start um, learning about each one of the students in the class. The first one was Mason. And he was a star soccer player. And he bought a cow with his money and named it Touchdown. So now we're going to keep on going and we're going to learn some of the rest of the students. So, chapter four, Emma. When Emma Embry was a little girl, she begged her parents for one thing, a cat. She didn't care if it was a minx cat with no tail or an alley cat with one eye. All she wanted was a cat. She was so desperate, she would have been happy with one of those scary-looking hairless cats. But Mr. and Mrs. Embry were interior decorators, which is a fancy word, fancy way of saying people who get paid to tell you what furniture to buy. And yes, people paid Mr. and Mrs. Embry money, and lots of it, to tell them what kind of furniture to buy. Because of their job, Mr. and Mrs. Embry were expected to have a perfect home. They had fancy furniture with long, fancy names like Renaissance armoires and Louis the 16th Baroque chairs. They had silk drapes and velvet carpet. Everything in their home was expensive or priceless or one of a kind. That meant they would have absolutely no animals in the house that might pee or poo or vomit on their precious interior decorations. Thus, no cat for Emma. There is a picture of Emma. Where'd it go? In there, how's that? Okay. Let me turn that light off. There we go. Now you can see the picture of Emma's cat. Emma and her cat. There we go. Okay. All right. Unfortunately, for Mr. and Mrs. Embry, Emma came home one day with a check for $1,037,037,004. And she planned to spend every dime of it on what she'd always wanted, cats. The next day, Emma bought every cat in the state, whether it was from a store or from an alley. She had them all shipped directly to her house. Within 24 hours, Mr. and Mrs. Embry's dream house became their nightmare house. Curtains were shredded, couches were covered in hair, and anything that looked like a bird or had a bird on it was utterly destroyed. Our beautiful home, Emma's parents cried. What have you done, you terrible child? For years, your home was more important than me, Emma said. Now my dream pet has ruined your dream house. Fair is fair. Hmm. Mr. and Ms. Embry growled and screamed and threw a tantrum. When they were done, they told Emma, If you have so much money, perhaps you and your cat should go live somewhere else. That's a fantastic idea, Emma said. She'd always wanted to live on an island of cats. Emma bought a large island in the Pacific Ocean off the coast of Polynesia. She renamed it Cat's Island, not to be confused with Tajramajama, Japan, also known as Cat Island. Then she chartered a plane and to take her and all her cats to their new home. She built a castle full of pillows and scratching posts. The televisions only played movies and shows about cats. Outside, there was a massive garden of catnip. There was only one law on Cat Island. No dogs allowed. Emma started to stray. Emma started a stray adoption service so that any time a cat needed a home, it was flown, first class of course, to Cat's Island. Emma finally had everything she ever dreamed of. There was only one problem. It turns out Emma is severely allergic to cats. Her eyes swelled up, then sealed shut with icky sticky eye goo. She broke out in hives and her whole body became itchy. She couldn't stop scratching, but the worst part was the sneezing. Every 30 seconds, she sneezed a terrible and loud snotty sneeze that scared all the cats away. And no matter how many allergy medicines she took, she was still allergic to her favorite thing in the world, 
Cat. Eventually, she had to leave Calf Island and go home. Chapter 5. William. All the students in Class 13 were careful not to use the P word around William. You know the one. Paranoid. I'm not paranoid, William yelled. It's not paranoia if someone's really after you. I'm telling you, we're all being watched. That woman has been watching me all day. But William, Ms. Linda said, it's your teacher. I'm supposed to be watching you. That's how school works. Ah, he shouted back. So you admit you've been spying on me. It's a conspiracy. He looked at the others with a smirk on his face. Told you. The other students were used to William being the most suspicious kid in classroom 13. So when William decided his life was in danger because of his lottery money, they shrugged it off. But you guys, he said, someone is going to try to rob me. Or worse, I just know it. Then hire bodyguards, Ethan told him. Of course, if you don't pay them enough, they could turn on you too. William agreed. Trust no one. He left school that day, taking a different path home than he normally did, in case he was being followed. He changed clothes as he snuck through the park, trying different disguises he had in his backpack. A neck brace, a nun's habit, a cowboy hat with a mustache. He finally decided to dress like an old man. He folded up the lottery check and hid it in his shoe. He changed his outfit, stuffed his clothes with newspaper, then added an oversized scarf and a hat. No one will recognize me now, he muttered. Out of the corner of his eye, William thought he saw an unmarked car pursuing him with bad guys inside. He hopped on a bus going the opposite way from his house. It took him clear across town. This will throw them off my trail, he thought. You look just like my grandfather, said a young woman on the bus. Please take my seat. So William sat down. But then the woman started staring at him. He was sure that she wanted to steal his billion-dollar check, too. At the next stoplight, he ran off the bus. When William got home, he ditched the disguise. But with each passing minute, he grew more worried. He was certain he would be robbed at any second. He cut a hole in his mattress to stuff the check inside. But he became scared that the check would get stuck in the mattress springs. And he'd have to rip it up rip it out. Last he checked, the bank wouldn't accept paper shreds as a check. He needed a new plan, but where would his check be safe? William jumped when, jumped when his bedroom door opened. It was his parents. Son, his dad said, is everything okay? Someone's trying to steal my money. Don't be para, I mean silly, his mom said. Why would someone steal your allowance? Not that money, this money. William showed them the lottery check. Oh, his dad said. Why don't we hide it for you, his mom said. If someone is after you, no one will suspect we have it. And as adults, we know lots of great hiding spots, his dad added. Great idea, William said. Take that, bad guy. He hugged his parents, thanked them, and went to sleep. Being cautious all day was exhausting. The next morning, William peeked out his window. No one was spying on him. His parents' plan had worked. As he went to thank his parents, he found they weren't home. His parents' clothes were gone. So were their suitcases. And so was his pet goldfish, Goldie. That's weird, he whispered. William's mind started to wander. Had his mom and dad stolen his money? Would they really run off without saying goodbye? Where... Were they thousands of miles away on a beach somewhere, sipping umbrella drinks and laughing about their double cross? And was the goldfish, that shifty-eyed sneak, secretly the mastermind of the whole thing? And was Goldie even his goldfish's real name? William chuckled to himself. That all sounds so, so paranoid, he thought. Soon, William would learn that his paranoia was correct. <gasps> His parents had run off with his money, and they were not coming home. <gasps> Chapter 6, Sophia. When she was born, Sophia was partially deaf. Now she wore hearing aids so she could hear, and every night as she drifted off to sleep, she listened to sounds of the rainforest on her laptop, 
she found the exotic sounds of insects and birds and monkeys quite soothing. There is a picture of Sophia. You see, Sophia loved nature. She talked to plants for hours, protected bugs, and hugged trees. Sometimes they were rather long, awkward hugs. Because of that, Sophia believed the term tree hugger was invented for her. Per copyright law, she thought she deserved a nickel every time someone said it. Not that she needed any nickels. Now she was a billionaire. After cashing her check for one billion thirty-seven million thirty-seven thousand thirty-seven dollars and four cents, she flew to South America and bought the Amazon. Not a piece of the Amazon, the whole Amazon rainforest. Then she put up handmade signs all around it that read, no saws allowed, protected area, keep out construction jerks, and trees are for hugging, not for cutting. The signs were made on recycled paper, of course. She put up hundreds of these signs without using a single drop of bug spray to protect herself. After all, she believed that bug spray harmed the atmosphere and hurt innocent bugs. But the Amazon insect didn't care about Sophia the way she cared about them. Sophia was bitten by 20 different species of bugs during her travels. By the time she was done, her skin was swollen with hives, warts, and awful rashes. Next, she built protective sanctuaries for all the endangered species there. She paid local hunters to stay away and spread the word that the Amazon was under new management. Whatever you say, the hunter said, shivering in their boots. Sophia's face was so monstrous from all the bug bites, she looked like a monster from a horror movie. Sophia didn't care what she looked like. If the pygmy mar marmosets could talk, she knew they'd thank her. Instead, most of them flung poop at her. Before she could buy Madagascar and save its rainforest, Sophia ran out of money. Property taxes, land deals, flights, bribes, and sign-making supplies were not cheap. The fat black markers alone were five bucks each. Still, Sophia had saved the rainforest. I love nature. I love nature, Sophia repeated to herself over and over while she itched and itched and itched and itched. Okay, so that's all for today. So we've met four of the students. Tomorrow we're going to meet Santiago and we'll see what he does with his billion dollars. All right, guys, have a great day. I'll see you tomorrow.